Okay, so we've officially hit the top of the hour and we have a full slate for the session. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you all to our uh, session today on openness, where we'll have three um, different topic or different talks on the topic. Um, our first talk today is on mathematics, risk, and messy survey data. This will be presented by Christy Thompson and Carolyn Sullivan. Christy is currently the research data management librarian at Western University. Her experience includes working as a data librarian with statistical consulting support at the University of Windsor, a data consultant at Princeton University, and as a freelance web developer. Christy co-edited the, the book Data Librarianship, the Academic Data Librarian in Theory and Practice, and has published articles on topics ranging from data documentation to Aboriginal sports. Her master's in library science is from Western University, and she has an undergrad in computer science and classical studies. Carolyn has a bachelor of science in computer science and just graduated with her master's of library and information science from Western University. While pursuing her MLIS, she completed a co-op in data librarianship. Her research interests include data science, social effects of technology, and historical treatment of marginalized groups within information environments. She hopes to continue learning and teaching on these subjects as an academic librarian. And we will have uh, all questions posed to the Q&A function in, in Zoom here. And then we'll take five minutes of questions at the end of each session. So Carolyn and Christy, please take it away. This is Christy Thompson. Carolyn Sullivan and I are going to be talking about our research into methods to judge whether a data set has been properly de-identified. The field of survey anonymization is large and complex, and many technical articles have been written about it, mostly by and for computer scientists. One of our goals with this presentation is to demystify this topic. I'm going to start by giving some background background on basic data anonymization concepts and explain the practical reasons why I started learning about data anonymization in the first place. I first became involved with data anonymization due to a project to restore some badly neglected data files. The project began with some survey files from Health Canada, released on Canada's open data portal as a result of an open government mandate. The surveys were published as CSV files without any code, without value or variable labels, and without code books. They were completely useless. With some colleagues, I reached out to the authoring division and they sent me some SPSS files and documentation and, oh dear, the files were full of identifying information, parts of postal codes, telephone area codes, you name it. Now, we could have just thrown the data files away but as far as we knew, these were the only usable data from some important public surveys. And after some back and forth, we realized that Health Canada didn't seem to know what to do with it. So that brought about the Data Rescue and Anonymization Project. And I'd like to give a shout out here to Alexandra Cooper from Queens, who worked with me on some of these files. The first step was to deal with direct identifiers. Direct identifiers are information collected by the researcher that plays study participants at immediate risk of being re-identified and include things like names, phone numbers, social insurance numbers, and small geographic areas. Exact dates linked to individuals such as birth dates are also identifying. Survey and health data sets generally also contain other details about respondents, such as age or marital status, that aren't directly identifying on their own. The variables are called quasi-identifiers and also create risk. Risk happens when you get enough information from a combination of quasi-identifiers to narrow down a person's identity to within an unacceptable margin of error. K-anonymity is a mathematical approach to demonstrating that a data set is anonymized. It was first proposed by computer scientists in 1998. It forms the basis of formal data anonymization efforts. Concept. It should not be possible to isolate fewer than K individual cases in your data set based on any combination of identifying factors. That is, a record cannot be distinguished from K minus one other records in its equivalence class. K is a number set by the researcher, usually five. Let's demonstrate with an example. We have a survey of workers at a particular factory and it has three demographic variables, age group, gender, and ethnic group. 
if an individual in the data set is a visible minority, is male, and is between 25 and 30, then for the data set to have K anonymity with K equal to 5, there must be at least four other individuals in the data set with the same characteristics. This must also be true for every other individual in the data set. Each person must have at least four data twins. In this case, cases 1, 6, and 13 form an equivalence class with K equal to 3. Case 14 in this sample has no data twins. It is a sample unique. The data set's K is the size of the smallest equivalence class in the data set. In this case, 1. To achieve K anonymity with a K of at most 5, you use data reduction techniques. Global data reduction is grouping variable responses into categories, for example, 10, age and 10-year increments. Or in some cases, it can mean completely removing variables from the data set. The other form of data reduction is local suppression, which means deleting individual cases or responses. To explain why you might want to do this, consider a member of the under 16 age group who responded married to a question on marital status. They might have their response to the marriage question deleted as an alternative to it further recoding the otherwise non-risky variables of age group or marital status. K anonymity is intended to be a form of guaranteed data anonymization. It guarantees that every record in the anonymized data will be indistinguishable from K minus one other records in the same data set. However, survey respondents are not generally told that no one will know which line of the data file holds their survey responses. They are told their answers to survey questions will be kept confidential. Let's return to the workplace data set. Cases 1, 6, and 13 still form an equivalence class with K equal to 3. So even if you know which people in the survey population match those characteristics, you can't tell which person matches which case. But they all answered a question about whether their workplace should unionize the same way. If your employee is in this survey, you don't know if he's person 1, 6, or 13, but you do know how he answered the question on joining a union whose confidentiality has been violated. Extensions of anonymity, such as L diversity, have been developed to deal with the attribute disclosure issue. However, they are difficult to implement while keeping a reasonable data utility level. For example, with L diversity, for every group of data twins in the data set, each confidential answer would need to have multiple values. Now imagine a typical survey data set with dozens of questions, each of which needs to be considered for L diversity for each equivalence class. However, this is less of a problem than it sounds because most of the literature on guaranteed data anonymization neglects the effects of sampling. If your data set is a sample of a larger population, a sample unique may or may not be a population unique, and respondents in your data set may have data twins in the larger population whose opinions or att attributes are unknown. So attribute disclosure is less of a concern in the case of a sample that is a small percentage of a large population. All right, enough theory. On to our examples, starting with an adolescent drug use survey. The National Anti-Drug Use Strategy Survey Series surveyed Canadian adolescents aged 13 to 15 and asked them questions about drug use, a rather sensitive topic. The first data set in the series had 1,502 respondents. Once we had removed those unfortunate direct identifiers that nearly gave me a panic attack, the demographics of concern were quite limited. They were age group, three categories, sex, two categories, geographic region with seven categories, invisible minority and aboriginal status with a total of three categories. Multiplication will show that these variables could produce 126 possible equivalence classes. And if these were distributed equally across the data set, we would expect each equivalence class to contain about 12 cases. However, some characteristics are much more common than others. In practice, I found 21 equivalence classes with only a single member and 42 equivalence classes with less than five members. K anonymity is hard. I had very few variables with only a few categories each in a large data set and could not satisfy the K anonymity test, let alone anything more stringent. We were able to achieve K anonymity by deleting the region variable. On the remaining variables, there were no equivalence classes smaller than five. But how risky would it have been to retain the region variable? Were our sample uniques population uniques? Being me, I decided to check this. 
I downloaded a Census of Canada public use file, subset it and manipulated the variables and weighted the file to produce a data set that matched my survey but represented the population aged 13 to 15 in Canada at that time as a whole. In effect, I created an artificial census of the population my survey was drawn from. In the artificial census data set, the smallest equivalence class had 370 cases, with most being considerably larger. Each sample unique in the drug use survey has 369 data twins in the general population. K-anonymity overestimated re-identification risk by a factor of 370. Sampling dramatically reduces the amount of risk in a data set. However, this is something you, is not something you can rely on without checking. In practice, for the data curator, it makes sense to look at K-anonymity as a way of safeguarding identity disclosure in sensitive data while relying on the sampling effect to deal with attribute disclosure in the case of the small sample drawn from a large population. However, complete or near complete samples of smaller defined populations, for example, a single workplace, are inherently much, much riskier due to the attribute disclosure effect. And this cannot be completely compensated for using K-anonymity. The curator in these cases may want to consider options for preserving or sharing data that do not require attempting to de-identify the data. Over to Carolyn. Okay, so the next Health Canada survey we reviewed was perceptions of water quality on reserve. The demographic data collected in the survey was similar to the NADS survey, and there was additional data related to participant location. While the NADS survey was sensitive due to the topic of interest, the data for this water quality survey is sensitive due to the population under consideration. Aboriginal communities in Canada are a marginalized population that experience cultural genocide from our government. Historically, research on First Nations groups has been arguably exploitative. Despite being the most studied minority group in Canada, they have often experienced minimal benefit from research and limited control over their own data. For these reasons, it was particularly important to ensure this data was properly de-identified. So with the NAD survey, we showed you how to test how robust your data set is against re-identification of survey participants by assessing the size of equivalence classes. Another method to test the robustness of your de-identification strategies is penetration testing. In penetration testing, you give your de-identified data set to a trusted individual who models the strategies a data intruder might use to re-identify study participants. This individual can then point out exploitable flaws in your data set. Penetration testing is particularly helpful for assessing the vulnerability of a data set to re-identification in the context of a wider data environment. This was exemplified through my penetration testing of the water quality survey data set. An early version of the data set included a variable indicating whether the participant lived on First Nations Reserve, their province, and their distance from the nearest city. Using this information, I realized a data intruder can easily construct a table of reservations by province with their distance to the nearest city. The data intruder could then compare the values for each reservation's distance to the nearest city with the distance to the nearest city reported by survey participants who live on reserve, plus or minus an error term, to create a short list for possible reservations where the survey participant might live. In some cases, there was only one possible reservation where a survey participant might live based on their responses. The data intruder, moreover, would only need publicly available data and open source tools to estimate where survey participants might live. For example, in my penetration testing, I used only publicly available data on reservation locations and open source tools such as Python scripts and geocoding apps that measure distance to the nearest city as the crow flies to generate my guesses for location. So to illustrate how this worked, here is a depiction of straight line distances of Alberta reservations from the nearest city. 
As a theoretical example, if a response said they lived on reserve and were only 80 kilometers from the nearest city with a population over 15,000, if I allowed a margin of error plus or minus 10% of 80 kilometers and considering possible locations, only two reservations are within 72 to 88 kilometers of the nearest city in Alberta, Sampson and Erminskine tribe, and they're like 10 kilometers away from each other. So the results of my penetration testing were that out of the 1,114 individuals in the survey, I narrowed down the possibilities to a single location of residence for 98. Of those 98, 24 were correct and many incorrect guesses for forward sortation area were close to the individual's actual forward sortation area. The accuracy of these estimates of participant location obtained could be improved through access to more specialized GIS tools, such as route maps, which would help us calculate distances via road versus as the crow flies. However, the current formulation demonstrates the risk posed by a data intruder with publicly available tools and data. So as a result of this penetration testing, we dropped the variable distance to the nearest city from publicly available versions of our clean data set. This example penetration testing should reinforce the need for data professionals to consider the data environment when releasing data into the wild, particularly with data related to locations of study participants. All right, thank you very much. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A for your group, uh, which is, do you know whether or not Health Canada has improved their data security and data de-identification practices in light of your findings? That's a good question. We got back to the person I was communicating with, explained the problem to them. And she did say that now they required people they hired who did surveys on their behalf to de-identify the data properly before returning it to them. So the surveys were, that were a problem were the ones that had happened before this shift happened. Um, and they don't seem to have released anything recently that gave me a heart attack. So hopefully, yes. Have you experienced any, you know, shift once you show how how difficult it is to truly anonymize the data set to see um, a data owner or a survey uh, collector to sort of want to shift in the other direction of of being more restrictive with the data than necessary? I haven't actually personally encountered that because. Basically, people tend not to bring me as a data management librarian in until after they've collected their data. However, I've joined our local research ethics board as an advisor on anonymization and data security. So it is something that I've been encouraging. I can, I can now encourage people to consider before they run their surveys. And it's something I've brought up at workshops. Um, it's not always super hard to anonymize a data set. I mean, if there's one variable you really want to collect because of it's important for your research, but you're worried about releasing it, you can release a version of the data that doesn't have that particular variable in it. But it's really a tough road to walk. Yeah. No, no, no. As we saw with Carolyn's thing, I mean, who would have thought distance to make nearest city was likely to be a real problem? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and it's interesting that you have joined your ethics uh, board or committee to help provide feedback um, because that is actually um, on the topic of our, of our next talk um, from Desi Karolova, um, who will be talking about their research and incorporating um, the IRB feedback um, and, and interviewing them to talk about um, best practices and how to how to form better relationships to, to better support good data collection and sharing. So I think that's a, it's a great opportunity for you and your organization. And it's also a nice uh, leeway into our next session. So Desi, I'll have you go ahead and share your slides. 
and I'm going to pull up your um, bio really quick. Okay, so um, continue to ask questions in the Q and A. Anything that we didn't get to or that we can't get to during the session, we'll follow up in Zoom. Um, our next, uh, sorry, we'll follow up in Whova. Our next uh, talk is called um, Optimizing Openness in Human Subjects Research, Balancing Transparency and Protection. Um, this talk is gonna be given by Desi Karolova, um, who has worked at the Qualitative Data Repository since its founding and is currently the repository's senior curation specialist. For the past five years, she has also served as a key researcher on QDR's Working with Sensitive Research Data Initiative aimed at developing strategies for ethically and legally sharing sensitive human participant data. Over the years, she has assisted in shaping the repository's policies, acquisitions, outreach, curatorial support for depositors, including in dealing with human participants and copyright constraints, and data management training. Desi's background is in political science and her related interests are in educating social science researchers more broadly in good data practice, starting in the research planning stages. So Desi, please take it away. Thank you. Um, and indeed, I couldn't have imagined a better segue um, from, the, from the previous presentation, which on the face of it was you know, about one very specific aspect of balancing transparency and protection. Um, but indeed, uh, making that interconnection, bringing that nexus into uh, both researchers and ethic board members' uh, consciousness is is a key part of the solution um, to find that 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 balance. But to to our talk, so um, as uh, Stephanie said in the introduction, our my organization, the Qualitative Data Repository, has been um, conducting a broader project that we call working with sensitive uh, data. And I will just say very briefly something about that and how this presentation fits in the bigger project. Um, and it's it's on the bigger project's ongoing, uh, but it seeks to develop a community, an epistemic community, uh, among different types of stakeholders in the academic ecosystem. Um, it's really focused on the U.S., so in the U.S. academic uh, academic ecosystem um, that brings their institutional perspectives. Uh, Makes it makes their institutional perspectives when data management data sharing are concerned um, makes them more familiar to each other. And um, what I mean by that, these multi stakeholder uh, conversations um, really need to happen amongst obviously data professionals at uh, research libraries and data repositories, like I'm imagining most of the people here, but also journals and funders and researchers themselves and IRBs, what we, what are called IRBs in the United States institutional review boards in other parts of the world called ethics boards more generally. Um, so the role of the ethics boards is what we really um, decided to investigate and I'm, that I'm gonna report some results um, here as part of the bigger uh, ongoing project that I just mentioned about. Give me one second because I'm having trouble advancing my slides. Oh, there we go. Um, so often when we talk about data sharing, and I won't even start with a bigger, bigger picture about the multiple benefits um, for uh, making data sharing possible, because again, this would be preaching to the choir, I imagine, in this in this particular uh, event. But we have in our heads uh, these these actors and factors that that may on the one hand, the neighbor, on the other, restrain um, data sharing. So researchers are the, 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 clearly the implementing actors. And so a lot of uh, individual um, handholding and helping with data management and planning happens, um, they're the target of, and then general uh, data management training. There's a, lot of there's a lot of academic research on what leads researchers to share or not to share, what may be incentives, what may be hurdles and so on. Then funders and publishers are, often seen as the enforcing factors. They're the ones from which the sticks and the carrots, but especially the sticks come, that they um, impose these uh, data sharing requirements on, on researchers. Then there are enabling factors, which are really multifaceted, but the fact that data are digital today, that's an enabling factor. It makes data sharing potentially at least uh, easier. Uh, the fact that there's dedicated research data services and training at university libraries uh, is an, an enabling factor. The existence and um, proliferation and 
enhancing of expertise among professional repositories, whether they're domain standalone or institutional, all of those act as um, enabling factors and technology technologies. The IRBs, to the degree that they are ever considered in that equation, in that landscape, in that ecosystem, are typically assumed to be or seen as hurdles. And we certainly, from our repository's practical point of view, see, um, you know, researchers often assuming and sometimes claiming that their IRBs will, you know, not allow them to share the data or they'll never um, consider a given um, product data were to be shared if that's part of the proposal and so on. So we decided to actually have some kind of empirical assessment of where IRBs are currently with respect to data sharing. And this is the results of that kind of narrower empirical study is what I'm going to talk about here briefly. Um, I'm going to skip this quickly in the interest of time. But what we did, the way we structured our study um, is to invite people from ethics from IRB boards, and usually we try to talk to the director of a given um, campus IRB um, um, to talk to us about a series of kind of structured questions on the topic of openness and data sharing as it's um, practiced currently among social science researchers. Again, our interest is in particular in the social sciences. And the way we selected the participants, or at least the people that we invited, was to look at a admittedly limited and, and somewhat intentionally biased uh, sample of, of institutions that I'd like to tell you a little bit more about. So we looked at um, the types of institutions that received the most amount of National Science Foundation um, funding from the Social Behavior and Economic Studies um, Directorate, um, the year when we started when we started designing the study, so that was 2018. Um, and we decided that yes, you know, that's certainly not a representative sample in any in any sense, but it is a very informative sample because the researchers on those campuses are the ones that are most um, clearly under the dual pressure uh, to plan for and and uh, potentially share their data, and also um, just like any researcher on any campus uh, to to continue and, and plan for protecting their human participants. And so those researchers we thought would be um, most under those pressures. And so the IRBs that serve them should be potentially um, most aware of the, of the potential tension and should have maybe developed kind of uh, a sense of how to, how to assist that and how, what their role was in, um, enabling both, both things to happen for their researchers. Um, the other thing that we kind of, maybe kind of had a sense of, but it really um, was confirmed in our conversations with people from, from such campuses was that these are better resourced uh, universities as a, as a whole. And as a result, their human research protection programs are better resourced in terms of both finances and staff. Uh, very often, actually, the person that we ended up talking to was not, their title was not even director of the IRB, it was director of the human participant uh, protection program, so a much broader kind of even set of, of responsibilities that, that, that they held. And so we thought that those types of places would have the, the time and staff and, and resources to develop the necessary expertise. And then another thing that we discovered, which we didn't actually necessarily anticipate, was that those are the types of places that then once they change their practices and, and policies and forms, um, that kind of new knowledge trickles down to other types of institutions that are um, you know, that use them as, as, as models in, in their daily um, work. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention here, so I'm going to obviously give a very brief sense of what uh, some interesting things are that I thought you as data professionals might want to know um, about IRBs and data sharing, but that we uh, shared our full de-identified transcripts uh, with people's permission as well. Uh, on our repository. And so when I share the slides, there is a, there's a DOI. So if you're interested in reading everything that people have to say about this in our sample, um, you can do that. Um, so we ended up with 17 individual participants that we um, conducted remote interviews with. And then additionally, we held two regional focus groups, one in with the Chicago-based institutions and the other one with DC, um, well, not around Chicago, so Chicago region-based and DC region-based institutions. And to those focus groups, we actually um, 
were able to attract people from institutions that are different ones that are that were not uh, only um, our ones. So then we do have some diversity in the in the ultimate um, results that, that we found. But the, the main focus in the individual interviews were these type of um, high research activity institutions. So in brief, what we found. Um, one thing that we wanted to learn is where these IRBs first for the first time ever, you know, learned about data sharing and that the fact that the, their researchers um, are thinking about the, those things. And we somewhat expected those answers and 100% of everybody that we talked to both in individual interviews and focus groups um, said that they first, their institution first learned about the, the data sharing needs of researchers from researchers own protocols. Um, and that's, again, that's to be expected. That is typically how IRBs operate. That is how they find out what they need to learn more about is um, in order to serve the, the needs of, of the camp, the researcher, the campus that they serve. But at the same time, the fact that that is the primary um, source of knowledge about data sharing for IRB suggests that there is room for and need for um, other uh, other sources and other contributors to, to this knowledge. And for example, I mean, I'll get to some recommendations, but it, all of us, all of the people that I imagine are listening here, data professionals, reaching out to IRBs to give them a more general understanding of the needs and problems and opportunities and, and motivations for data sharing uh, might be worthwhile. That it's not, that it shouldn't necessarily be that um, IRBs only learn about data sharing in response to, to specific protocols that they are reviewing. Um, some, again, as a continuation of what then happened once a, an IRB learned about this, uh, aspect of doing research nowadays for their for their for their um, constituents is that they some staff research, some staff decided to research further on their own and so they did try to read up on possibilities and opportunities and so on and venues and all of that but that was more unusual and really was mostly driven by personal initiative when it did happen um, most rely most IRBs that we talked to also said that they rely on the research own understanding of what the possibilities out there are. Um, and some reported that when they discovered that this would be something that they need to address, um, they realized that there's legal considerations and they immediately also involved their campuses, um, you know, legal experts, general counsel and so on. Um, not in all cases, but in some. Um, none of the interviews that we uh, spoke with mentioned any kind of institutional or broader guidance as an initiating driver of developing that kind of knowledge and expertise, which we thought was interesting. Uh, and by internal or external here, I mean internal to their university um, or external, just knowing generally or encountering on their own, for example, uh, NSF or NIH um, expectations for data sharing. None of them um, cited that as, a, as an initial source of knowledge about data sharing. Then the less expected answers that we encountered from some respondents was that um, researchers who were trying to reach, uh, who are trying to use uh, data, existing shared published data as secondary users were required to fill out various, various data use agreements that then required them in turn to get uh, approval from their IRBs. And so they would bring to the IRB these data use agreements and ask them to sign, approve, you know, sign off on it. Um, that seemed to both surprise and displease IRBs, which in many cases did not think that that should be their role, but these types of UIs um, exist out there. And so that was a, a source of data sharing knowledge. Um, then also from PIs need to cooperate internally on a team or with with the researchers at other institutions. That was a commonly cited scenario and also the need for some uh, PIs who were about to leave a given campus and wanted to take quote unquote their data with them for future work on it. Um, that often got the IRBs involved. Now, these are both mo more limited types of data sharing than what we generally talk about when we use that term. But you know, in both of those types of scenarios, um, detailed plans are still necessary. And so it, it uh, was brought to the IRB's uh, attention. And sometimes some, like a handful of people cited that just reading in the media about science fraud made them think about what would it take, you know, how could these kinds of things be prevented and data sharing often was brought up as the answer. So then they started thinking about that and their their organization's role in that in that process, in that research process. The other thing that we thought was quite interesting is that 
to the degree that IRBs have changed their policies, and I'll say in a minute what that looked like, but the policy development um, for these institutions just followed uh, research or practice. And to some degree, again, that's understandable and typically how IRBs uh, operate. Um, it, however, has uh, some negative consequences. It does not really lead to comprehensive knowledge development and expertise development. It reflects the idiosyncrasies of particular studies. So maybe an IRB figures out how to do, uh, how, how a certain researcher should handle their human participant protections while enabling a very particular type of data sharing, but that doesn't lead them to have a more comprehensive um, sense of what they would like uh, researchers to do more generally. So it leads to a lot of ad hoc solutions. Um, many said, nonetheless, as, as they were talking, they kind of caught themselves saying, maybe that is for right now the most um, reasonable approach. Maybe there's nothing much that we can do differently from the IRB perspective, but all of them wished that there was a more centralized source of uh, more uniform information and more standardized forms um, for them to use. And I'll suggest at the end kind of what, again, professionals could go on that particular front. The most common reaction, so here's what policy change looked like in most cases. The most common reaction, again, pretty much everybody said that they did that. Uh, when, when IRBs discovered that data sharing is something they need to address, they changed the IRB application form. Many said that typically questions about data storage during the course of a project had existed on their forms. And in some cases, they said the questions about disposition of the data after the end of a project had existed as well. But more recently, in the past two to three years, they've started adding questions, such very explicit questions about data sharing, such as, will the data be shared in any form? Will the shared data be de-identified? or not, what will be the period of retention? And that we saw actually as a positive sign that that's the kind of thing that hopefully more and more IRBs will do, be very explicit in their uh, questions for researchers about these things. Less common that we saw, but even more encouraging, what we term kind of proactive IRB. Um, so many learned that, you know, went out of their way, research and learned that, okay, there are these funded, sorry, there are these funded requirements um, that our researchers are expected to meet. So we better do something about it and figure out how to help them. Um, many did something, again, very um, positive uh, in terms of promoting data sharing. They discouraged PIs who said, who used old kind of outdated templates that said nobody but me or my team will ever see these data. They discouraged PIs from promising such th uh, things. They told them what is a more realistic approach and truly proactive step. Um, in some cases, IRB respondents reported that they inquired about data sharing plans if none were mentioned. Now, if every IRB did that, you know, we think that that's a bit, that, would be, that would be a big step towards um, uh, enabling that, enabling the reaching of that balance between human participant protections and um, transparency, and research transparency and openness. The least common, and honestly, this one person that I'm going to quote here <laughs> was the only representative who expressed that level of shift in mindset about what data sharing really means and what the IRB is thinking about it should be. So it's very, you know, um, unique, but nonetheless, we thought it's so it's, it's so uh, rewarding to hear somebody from the IRB world say that, that it's worth quoting. So that person said in submissions, people, people meaning researchers will say, this study project might lead to increased knowledge about X and we, the IRB, take that on faith, but if data never gets out into the scientific community and is never shared, that benefit can't be realized. Um, now, again, I don't believe any of you need to be convinced of that, but to hear an IRB um, staff person or director really say that was um, quite unexpected and, and um, rewarding. Um, now, the specific level of knowledge about data sharing possibilities, uh, access controls, things like that, we, we went into a lot of detail asking about these things. Here, I can't report on it, all of it, but just to give you a sense of how much room there is for education and improvement and interaction between data professionals and, and IRB professionals is just to give you a sense of the answer, uh, the question, how familiar the, the IRB you know, as a whole is with data repositories on a very general level, not any of the more specific things that, that they could be aware of. Um, so 10% said they're not at all familiar. 30% um, said they're very familiar. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. And then a whole 60% said that they're only somewhat familiar. So there certainly is a lot of room of, um, for improvement and education. So the lessons are data management is a holistic effort and there's, um, need for both intra-campus uh, coordination and collaboration of the sort, for example, that Christy talked about. So people who know the data management world, who know uh, data sharing expectations, who know solutions that exist for appropriate data sharing um, should reach out and, and uh, 
relate some of their expertise to, to the local ethics board. Um, and then of course the need for more broadly inter-institutional coordination for which, um, you know, that, that that's maybe a topic for, for another time. So what you specifically as a data professional can do, join or initiate a coordination group on your campus. And on some campuses, these kinds of places will already exist. Research data stewards is a common name that, that, um, that I've seen um, to, to label that type of um, coordination. Um, reach out personally, depending on how big or small your campus is, maybe it's a, a whole coordination group it doesn't, certainly does not exist and maybe it's not even the appropriate forum, but maybe reach out personally to co colleagues at the Human Research Participant Program or the IRB program. Um, draw a list of the relevant resources, which may include further places like the Cyber Infrastructure Office, the IT Office, which has a specific set of expertise that may, may assist with data sharing. So draw a list of relevant resources you're gonna share uh, with PIs who may also not realize that nexus that exists between their, their data management sharing plans and their IRB plans. Make that um, interaction explicit for PIs. And one way that you can do this very, very simply when consulting on specific projects and specific uh, GMPs, ask to see the PI's consent script. Make sure that they're not promising something in their consent script that they cannot um, satisfy, it, well, the, they're not, not promising something in the consent script that is very different from what they're promising in their data management plan and the two cannot uh, be satisfactorily reconciled. And then if training more generally on GMPs, uh, on GMP, the GMP process, highlight that nexus and the need for alignment for, for PIs. Um, one thing, I'm actually gonna leave this with, with this slide. Uh, what we at QGR are also trying to do further is we're also analyzing, um, the public guidance documents that IRB, IRB is given that for that we have a, a larger sample um, of similar types of institutions to see whether what we're seeing, what we saw in these um, kind of more qualitative interview type uh, in this research, whether that's now being translated into the public guidance that IRBs give to, to their campus uh, community. And already very briefly, I can kind of foreshadow that we're seeing change in uh, for sure in that in the language and in the types of details that IRBs go into when they talk about data sharing. Um, we are talking to the IRB community through their own channels. So Primer is an organization, the main professional organization of IRB professionals, and um, our, we are um, deeply involved there and trying to get their conversations that exist about data sharing kind of um, focus and to, to relate some of the expertise that we have and connect IRB professionals to uh, existing repositories. Then promulgating a consent script, a very small paragraph basically level uh, insertion into existing IRB, uh, into existing consent scripts that very explicitly discusses data sharing and the specifics, the specific plans of a given um, PI for data sharing in their project. Um, and I will leave it there. Again, this is for any of you who may want to take that work further and continue uh, extending it on your specific campus. Um, this is a place where you can find our suggestion. And again, of course, it can be, can be customized and tailored and so on. Um, and then if you are interested in keeping in touch with us on that particular topic, we have part of our website where we um, post, well, where we have the broader a broader project summary, summary and where we post updates uh, on all of these things. So thank you very much and um, looking forward to your questions. Great, thanks, Jesse. We actually went over time a little bit on your call or on your talk, which is good because you shared lots of really good information about your project and you provided really good recommendations. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A, but we are gonna go ahead and jump over to the next talk and then we'll loop around for questions and anything that's not answered here, we can follow up in Whova as well. So um, Anika, I'm gonna have you start to share your slides. While you're doing that, I'll do your um, introduction. So Anika is going to be presenting on how to guide anon anonymization. Um, Anika has eight years of experience in processing qualitative and quantitative data for long-term preservation in the Finnish Social Sciences uh, Data Archive, the FSD. In recent years, Anika has been concentrating on processing quantitative data and anonymization issues. Uh, she also works with International Survey Collection as a data processor. Anika's background is in social sciences and she holds a master's degree of social science um, in a major subject of social policy. So Anika, please take it away. 
Thank you. And thank also for the previous uh, presentations. And especially the first one was really good start because it uh, really uh, told about the statistical view of anonymization. I have a little bit different point of view, but you will see it soon. So yes, let's start. So I'm Annika Valaranda from Finland. Mm. I work at Finnish Social Science Data Archive, FSD archives qualitative and quantitative digital research data and disseminate data for reuse for students and research communities. We archive and disseminate mainly anonymous data, and that is the reason why we have developed training workshops for the researchers about how to anonymize my data. Uh, in anonymization, we try to achieve anonymous data determined by EU General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which means that data you need, person cannot be re-identified with reasonable effort based on the data or um, data or by combining the data with additional information. Uh, there's usually guidelines for using anonymization techniques, uh, but not much more. Uh, so not about uh, how to make decision making of which information should be anonymized or and which not. Teaching researchers to anonymize decrease the time that we spend anonymizing the data in FSD. It's a usually very time consuming task as you maybe already know. Uh, we have done anonymization by human mind deduction by, uh, mainly. There, uh, at the moment, there is no like udematic uh, available uh, uh, processes, udematic processes for anonymizing qualitative or quantitative data yet. They are statistical anonymization tools for quantitative data, and also lately some qualitative tools have been published. But even when using anonymization tools, human mind deduction must be done which information to anonymize and which not. Also, researchers usually have no readiness for using statistical anonymization tools. Uh, statistical anonymization tools also focus on small frequencies and that, uh, that are not always a sign of identifying information. This doesn't mean that I don't support using statistical anonymization tools. I really recommend research to researchers to use them if they have skills for them. Uh, so we have uh, here in Finland, we have organized two to three hour session to researchers or students where we present the main principles of anonymization and practice anonymization with two imaginary exercises for both uh, quantitative and qualitative data. First, we talk about five most important things to consider and tell practical tips separately for qualitative and quantitative data. We also tell about anonymization techniques briefly, uh, which are like usually manual at that time. Then we give exercise to participants and uh, the researcher will discuss about possible anonymization solutions alone or in a group. Uh, the five principles that we tell researchers to consider, or also students, there have been many students in our workshops. Uh, the first is a population and sampling. Uh, population and sampling is the first information about participants of the study. Information can be very detailed or on the level that it's very difficult to know who are in the data set in advance. Uh, the second is a content of data. That is the most important, I think so. Uh, uh, there, we got to point out the direct and indirect identifiers. Uh, also to think about how sensitive uh, the data is, the content is. Also uh, consider if there is um, third parties mentioned in this or uh, information about third parties in that data set because those uh, information should be protected also. Data set age uh, also have effect on anonymization. Uh, information and then the fourth uh, stage is uh, 
information available in other sources. Uh, I will, I usually tell about which sources to consider. And then the last but not least is usability versus anonymity. It's very vital part, part of process to choose uh, which uh, information to anonymize and which information to remove and which to keep because uh, researchers should think um, or we encourage them to think about which uh, information are the most important considering the future research on that field and things like that. And I think in anonymization and decision making in anonymization, the most important is the relation between population, sam population and the sam sample and the content of the data. And that is, not, that is the reason why there is not similar anonymization plans for data sets because those two things vary very much. So there is also, if I could say that you can have a similar anonymization plan basically only for some theory uh, data that have collected, uh, have the same population and the same uh, questions in, in inquiry. So let's think about various data sets. Uh, the population can be, these examples are from the data that we have Mm, archived in our archive, FSD. So there is intravenous drug, drug users, members of Finnish Diabetes Association, Finnish people suffering from depression, users of uh, public libraries in Finland, and persons who had had a family member work in the Kostamus, which is a city uh, construction project. So as you can see, the size of these universities varies a lot. And in other groups, it's easier to deduce who may be in the data set. In the blue box below, you can see examples of collected information in the studies, and those vary. In some studies um, are collected opinions and attitudes, career information. In some studies, there is information about living environment, personality, uh, well-being and family information, but those vary a lot also. So collected information is uh, always additional information of those persons. The more information is collected, more we know about the person. The type of collected information still varies. Some uh, information enables identifying better than other. For example, we could assume that attitudes and opinions cannot identify persons as well as family information. So we try to uh, explain these things to researchers and students and so they could uh, start thinking the anonymization uh, right way. We also um, encourage research to ask uh, when they are thinking some detailed information, whether they remove it or not, we guide them to ask following questions. Is this information rare in the target population? If no, you can keep it. If yes, I, you, ma you may ask um, or you should ask, uh, can outsider get to know that information easily? And if the question, if the answer to that question is, is not, you can, maybe keep that information in this data a data and if yes if that if it's easily get to know that information you really need to delete that information so this uh, deduction uh, chain can help researcher to to decide to anonymize or not that information they have they have seen in their data set. After teaching these main principles to the participants of training, uh, they will get two exercises. Here is example, sorry, this is, uh, no, this is in English, I'm sorry. <laughs> because I was thinking that we have all, only examples of Finnish um, transcriptions, but they, ha they had been translated and I, I forgot that. So, uh, so we give first them. There is on the 
I don't know which side, but yeah, in the left side, there is an unanonymized transcription and we give them to participant and we ask them to think different possibilities to anonymize and give some ideas what they would like to anonymize or the things that are identifying information. And after some moment, we go through anonymization suggestions and there on the right side, you can see one, one possible anonymization plan that we off offer to participants. But as you know, anonymization can be made um, in many ways. So this is only one example. And also we give practical tips. Uh, there are also important uh, some examples of practical tips that we give are, so we tell the researchers to, to think anonymization, uh, to think that anonymization is not something to consider uh, in the end of the research project, but it should be it, it should be needed to take account in the beginning of it. Uh, when minim minimizing collected background information or asking things already structured form helps anonymizing a lot in the end of the research project. Uh, and in anonymization, we recommend documentation. Uh, in qualitative transcriptions, we guide to use marks for anonymized parts. In quantitative data, we guide to anonymize first numeric variables and then string variables. And um, we also ask to delete pseudonym lists and original data after anonymization. So my presentation was that. So I really want to thank you and also remind that we have also in English, we have a guidance of anonymization in our website, in our data management guidelines. So there are those things and much more in those websites. So thank you. Annika, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, we have a question in the Q&A that uh, you might uh, be able to answer, uh, which is, um, I've heard that data older than 10 years is almost impossible to identify. Hold on. Question got moved. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've heard that it's almost impossible to identify data that is older than 10 years to deduce who is in the data set. Do you believe this to be true? No, no, I don't <laughs> believe. Uh, it really depends, uh, as I said, about the uh, universe, the target group, and the information that has been collected. So you, you, you also need to think about uh, the information that other people know about uh, other people yeah, around. And if you know that, or how could I say, mm, like 10 years ago, we really remember those things yet. So I, I would not say that it's, it's un, like anonymous data. Yeah, that makes sense. And that aligns with uh, the first presentation and their discussion about the older health data that they found that uh, could be used to uh, identify participants. So your answer makes perfect sense um, in alignment with that. And um, I would encourage uh, any other questions to be posed directly to the presenters or taken over to Whova. Um, I'd like to thank all the presenters today. This was a great session and I've certainly learned a lot. And this is an important topic for our community in the, in the broader social sciences um, with anonymization. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, we'll see everybody on the next session. Thank you.